Uh, so we just got back from our Every Nation World Conference. So we had uh, 80 nations and 5,000 people converged in Orlando, Florida. And I just can't even begin to tell you how cool it is for people from Thailand and Zimbabwe and England and New Jersey all worshiping together. It is unbelievable. And um, so very cool moment. And uh, so uh, I have a couple stories from the, the conference. I hope that's okay. Um, some I can't tell you, but uh, get me afterwards and I'll tell you. And, uh, but, but some from here. So uh, just so you know, uh, Pastor D uh, Dottie and I traveled uh, together. And uh, it's kind of funny because we're both helpless. Like Dottie can't do anything without Jim helping. And I am like a 12-year-old uh, kid, it, my, ch my wife leading me through the airport, get me through security and all that kind of stuff. So this was interesting. Um, the good news is we made it. And, uh, but it was funny, Pastor Dottie, she's one of these ones who gets like all geared up before we're going to go, you know. So weeks ago, she's beginning to tell me about, uh, I found a really cool way to pack clothes now. My dresses won't get mixed up. You need to wrap them in tissue, I found out. And I'm like... Daddy, I'm a guy. I don't care. I don't care about that stuff. Why are you telling me that? You know, and and so and then she was sure to let me know she bought a steamer. So then if it does get wrinkled, she can do this. Once again, don't care. And then, but then she let me know too. You know, my luggage was looking beat and worn. So I went to TJ Maxx and I got new luggage. So I just need to describe. So first of all, look at Pastor Dottie. Now, now let me just describe to you what her luggage looks like. It looks like a little kid ate a whole packet of Skittles and vomited up on them. All right? It's purple, green, yellow, white, orange, all of it. In fact, uh, uh, Marge Garcia, our children's minister, she'll let you know. We landed in Orlando, and we're all waiting for our luggage. And I guess I, saw, I go, Marge, uh, 10 bucks says you can't guess which, which piece of luggage is Dottie's. <laughs> there it is, right? And so we, we got all that one. And so... But 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 as we were as we were flying, we were flying United out of Newark, and so Pastor Dottie's like, I think I'm gonna watch a movie, and I just thought, oh, that's great, Dottie. I'm gonna read my Bible, all right. But uh, <laughs> but you just go ahead and you go ahead and watch the movie. She didn't have earphones to watch the movie, so I gave her my earphones, and so they're earbuds, and so she was her. She didn't know there was such thing. And so she jams those things in her ears, and she looks at me, these things are great! <laughs> and I'm like, tone it down a little bit, Dot, tone it down. And so, uh, so she's, she's going through all the movies. And just so you know, your women's pastor, uh, she wasn't drawn to like a cute dog movie or something like that. She goes right to A Star is Born. And so, uh, and so she, she was watching that one. But, uh, but I say all that to say this. So she's seen, there's been three renditions of it. So she understands the story. And so both times she tried to watch it going there and coming home, and she missed the ending every time. <laughs> but the good thing is she had seen the other previous versions, so she knows the ending. So she knows where the story's going the whole time. And, and I really wanted to mention that because I think that's, that's pretty important. Like when you, you know the story, if you know the ending in the beginning, Everything in between can be anchored between these two things. It's unbelievably important. And if you're a guest here, we're, we're actually in a new series called Casket Empty. And we've been going through months through the book of Genesis. We're going to go through the entire Bible. But if you remember, we began the, the entire series by, you can sum up the Christian story um, really by three trees, we said. There's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. That's the beginning. And then the ending, we know there's the tree of life that we, we partake from, and we live forever with our God. But in between that is another tree, the cross of Jesus Christ. And our lives are playing out between these things. But, but my, my appeal to us is it's important to know the beginning and the ending, that it anchors us for all the madness that's in between. Um, uh, so I need you to participate with me this morning. Is that all right? Um, and so, so here's where we go. We're going we're gonna to read a study. Uh, that uh, they did in Cambridge. We've done this once before, but I think it'll be helpful. Izzy, if you could put that um, up on here. And so, according to, uh, read with me, please. According to research at Cambridge University, it order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total, what? 
mess, and you can still read it without a problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. And so if we know the anchor of the first and the, the, the beginning and the ending, it helps us to make sense of everything that's going on um, in between. And so I want to give you uh, two things to grab on. Uh, something that, uh, that, like, in the craziness that can be our life and our circumstances, if you can remember these two things this morning, it will get you through moments of madness in your life. And here's what they are, is you need to know this. Number one, God is with you. Like, if you know Jesus Christ this morning, God is with you. And here's the second thing. God is good. Despite what your circumstances say, you must know this and grab onto this. God is good. God is with you, and God is good. God is with you, and God is good. Grab on with both these hands, and that will see you through the difficult moments of your life. We're going to read about um, uh, the young man named Joseph. And let me tell you what, he's going to have a wild ride. Um, and, but through it all, he's going to grab on. He's going to understand that God is with him. God is good, and it's going to get him through uh, his moment of darkness. And so, Lord, I pray just grace this morning uh, for us as we open up your word uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're actually going to finish the book of Genesis. How about that? We've done an entire uh, um, book of the Bible. And uh, Genesis, I need to cover chapters 37 to 50 today, so buckle up, all right? Uh, and so uh, what I want to do is I want to recap those chapters for you because I think it's unbelievably important in the totality of our series. We need to get you from the Garden of Eden all the way to the new heaven and the new earth in the book of Revelations. And so well, I want to keep the story moving. And if you remember last week, we, we began uh, talking about Abraham, Isaac, and who did we cover last week? Jacob, right? And we remember Jacob uh, had a little bit of a different family life because he had two wives, and, and then those two wives, they, they competed with one another, and before you know it, they're having baby wars. Anybody? Like, they, they would be a TLC show, a reality TV show for sure, and so they're seeing who can have the most babies. Finally, they get 12 sons, and these sons, spoiler alert, would become the 12 tribes of Israel, okay? And so, uh, so uh, we get um, uh, Jacob. He has a favorite son. Can we say dysfunction? And when I'm saying he's not like just secretly, hey, you're my favorite, you know? Uh, for the record, I do that with both my daughters. Like whoever's with me, I'm like, don't tell your sister, but you're my favorite, okay? And that, so we kind of do that thing. Um, and, and, but, but we see that, but Jacob is overt. He's like, no, no, um, my boy Joseph, he really is my favorite, the rest of y'all are B-team. This is my boy. And so much so they gave him, we, we all remember this, he would have a coat of many colors. It was a, it was a distinguishing jacket for him. It's kind of like this. Um, um, Joseph, his, his old man, Jacob, he went to Short Hills. And he went to the Gucci store, and he's getting him this fine thing. And he like puts, man, Joseph puts that thing on. Ooh, ooh, look at me, right? And then his brothers get to open up their jacket, and it's in the... TJ Maxx uh, uh, container, right? Or excuse me, Walmart. And they put on their Walmart jacket. If you have a Walmart jacket, I'm not judging you. I'm just saying this is what kind of happened. And so that's how he goes. And, and, um, and so that, needless to say, this is going to get a little bit of animosity among Joseph and his brothers. And, and then to top it off, uh, Joseph is just, can we just say he's not very uh, uh, socially in tune. And so he begins to share with his brothers this amazing dream that he had. He says, Boy, fellas, guess what? I had a dream, and all you fools were bowing down and worshiping me. Isn't that amazing? What is your dream, you know? And so it's, 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 it's stirring up the angst. Um, uh, Jacob wants to know what his sons are doing as they're out in the field shepherding, so he sends the little tattletale Joseph to check up on them. And as he goes, he finds them, and off in the distance, the brothers say, the dreamer's coming. I say we handle him. And as he goes out, they plot to kill him. They beat him up, and they throw him into a cistern. Um, they're going to just pre they're gonna pretend that, that a wild animal killed him, and they'll tell their father that. Well, well um, Judah, uh, one of the brothers, he has another idea. Hey, let's not kill him. Let's just sell him into slavery. Then we can get some money for it. Did I mention there's a dysfunctional family? All right? And so what do they do? They actually sell Joseph into slavery. And so I need you to just feel this so we just don't read over that. 
Like, like this is a young man, so he's stripped naked, given to the Ishmaelites, and he's going to be sold as a piece of meat. And I, I can't help but thinking Joseph, in the long journey into Egypt, he's got to be going, all right, I'm, you're waiting for someone to say, hi, just kidding, you know, I'll puncture. But that moment never comes until he's sold uh, into a, an Egyptian government official's house by the name of Potiphar. But the Bible's crystal clear about something. It lets us know while he's in Potiphar's house, sold as a slave, God was with him. And something amazing happens. He just begins to grow and blossom in his leadership as a slave. Suddenly, all these organi organizational skills, leadership skills, bubbling up in Joseph's life. In fact, everything he touches turns to gold. And so he's rising to prominence in Potiphar's house. And so everyone's taking note of this guy, Joseph especially Potiphar's wife. And Potiphar's wife, I mean, the Bible is clear about our boy Joseph. Not only did he have a cool coat, but he was ripped. Six-pack abs. Like the Bible says this, that Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Brother was looking good. And so Potiphar's wife took note of that. Potiphar's gone. She propositions him. In fact, tries to grab a hold of uh, that guy's clothes, he runs, gets, gets out of his jacket and runs away. Uh, for the record, fellas, that's what I want to record. Sometimes you just got to run. Run, Forrest, run. And so he did. <laughs> but, you know, when it comes time, uh, Potiphar's in a little bit of a dilemma. Because now he, Potiphar's wife's going to say, he tried to rape me. And Joseph's going to say, oh, no, no, she tried to seduce me. Who wins? Exactly. Slave loses every time. He gets thrown into jail. He's thrown into jail, um, actually the king's prison. And it, the Bible's sure to tell us this, but in the prison, God was with him. And he once again rose to prominence and preeminence and began to run the entire prison. And I don't know if you've ever suffered at all and been through something, um, but I think you'll find this. When you go through difficulty, it does something to your heart. Like it does something to your soul. And we see something an empathy and a sympathy starts to be birthed into the heart of Joseph. And, he, and there's uh, two criminals in, in the prison with him. One was the king's cupbearer and one was the baker. And they looked forlorn, distraught. I don't even know what forlorn means, but I, it sounds like a cool word. And so, and so he sees that in their distress and he says, um, what's the problem? And, and they said, um, um, man, we, we had these dreams, but there's no one to interpret. Joseph's like, hey, uh, I, I can interpret dreams. The God inside of me can help me interpret dreams. And so tell me your dream. So uh, the, the cupbearer tells him his dream. And, and Jake, Joseph's like this, good news. Three days, you're getting up out of here. And when you do, and you're once again at Pharaoh's right hand, remember me. And he's like, sure, we'll do that. And then now the baker's like, oh, this is amazing. So uh, here's my dream. What does it mean, Joseph? Sorry, bro. Three days, you're losing your head. <laughs> and he walks away. So kind of an awkward silence after that one. And so Cupbearer gets uh, uh, brought again to, to Pharaoh's right hand, but he forgets Joseph. Two years waiting in the prison till finally Pharaoh has a bad dream. This is before Netflix and everything. You wonder why all these nightmares and stuff are going on. And, and so Pharaoh has a nightmare. He too is distraught. And so he's like, what am I going to do? I can't figure out what this dream means from the gods. Cupbearer goes, oh my gosh, I know a guy. In prison. And so they clean Joseph up, bring him to Pharaoh's right hand. Pharaoh spits out his dream, and, and Joseph interprets it for him. You're going to have seven years of enormous wealth and increase, and then you're going to be followed by seven years of, of harsh famine. And then Joseph pipes up with his newfound organi organizational skills, leadership. Here's what I would do I would store up the seven years of, of the seven years of wealth and increase that would prepare us for the seven years of famine. And so, so they do that. Um, and here's what happens now. I'm, i got to get through this fast. Uh, now Jacob's sons uh, grow hungry. We have the seven years of increase. Now the years of famine are engaged. Jacob's family is starving uh, in the land of promise in Canaan. So they got to go to Egypt. So Joseph's brothers go. And as fate would have it, God would ordain it, uh, Joseph sees his brother. But here's what you, you got to know this, is it's been 13 years. Joseph was 17 when he was sold as a slave. He's now 30 years old in, in Pharaoh's court. And so he looks like an Egyptian. 
He's speaking Egyptian. And so he sees his brothers uh, for the first time. And as soon as he sees his brothers, he kills every one of them. <laughs> no, he didn't do it. You guys know your Bible. Oh, good. Some of you guys are like, yeah. How many would do that? I think I would do that. All right. But he doesn't do that. But he does mess with them for a little while. And he doesn't reveal who he is. He messes with them for a little while um, uh, in, until he sees his brothers bowing down before him. And he remembers the dream that God was in the whole thing. And finally, he tells his brothers this. He reveals who he is. I'm Joseph. Rightfully so. They're terrified. And he says this. Don't be afraid. He says, what you meant for evil, God meant for good. Because God is good. Lord, pray grace, Lord, as we enter, uh, as we open up your word here. Uh, so here it is. How did Joseph do it? He grabbed on with two hands. That he recognized that God is with me and God is good. And that got him through the dark night of the soul. And so I want to just walk through those two points real quick this morning. So number one is this, is that God is with you. Like, I don't know what you're going through, but if, if you know Jesus today, I want to assure you, God is with you. Do you know the term uh, goodbye? Do you know that's a, a contraction of the saying that God is with you? It's, it's God be with ye. Goodbye is what it is. And so when you tell somebody goodbye, you're saying God be with you. Um, and so um, Genesis chapter 39, verses 2 and 3, I want to just read that God was with Joseph uh, in Potiphar's house. Notice in, in chapter uh, uh, 39, verses 2 and 3, it says this, The Lord was with Joseph, and he became a successful man. And he was in the house of his Egyptian master. His master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to succeed in his hands. Now, read uh, Genesis 39, verses 21 to 23. This is Joseph in the prison. Uh, it says this, But the Lord was with Joseph, and showed him steadfast love, and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made to succeed. And so um, throughout Joseph's life, we're going to see seven times that the scripture is going to say, God was with him, God was with him, God was with him, God was with him. It's the Bible's way of pounding into you that when circumstances look off the rails in your life, it's reminded you, hey, don't forget God's with you. Don't forget God's with you. Don't forget God's with you. And so over and over again, he's letting us know. But our circumstances will scream otherwise, that God's abandoned you. He's forgotten you. And I want to tell you, it's not true. If I can remind you, you grab a hold of God and you confess, no, God is with me. God is with me. Um, and so, uh, how many remember uh, this guy? Do we, got a, do we got, where's Waldo, is he? Do you remember this guy? You guys remember Waldo? Um, uh, he, his, the, the creator was this guy, Martin Hanford. Sold over 40 million books around the world, okay? And if you're not sure what he is, what they do is they'll, they'll mask this guy, Waldo, in this picture of just uh, of everything. And, and, the, and it's trying to cha uh, train children's eyes to find Waldo. What, what the, the goal was to, to train kids to be aware of their surroundings and to find what they're looking for. And if I might uh, uh, just, uh, that's kind of our job. Like our jobs at times is not to find Waldo, but it's to find the Lord in our circumstances. And so it's why every week you see me get up here and I got the same message just over and over. Read your Bible and pray. Read your Bible and pray. Read your Bible and pray. And so that's our way of training our eyes to see God in our circumstances, in our situations. God is with you. Uh, let me maybe bring this home for some of us. Uh, God is with you in the fire. Like in your fiery trial, I want to let you know that God is with you. Uh, I know we have some guests here, so I, I wasn't always like a pastor guy. I was a hockey player. Uh, and so I played for the Philadelphia Flyers. We're just up the road there in Pennsylvania. And uh, uh, natural transition, right? Go, go from playing pro hockey to that. And, and so, uh, but we had our strength coach in Philadelphia, this guy, Jimmy McCroston, and I hope he's podcasting right now, because Jimmy was the coolest strength coach I ever had. And here's what McCroston would do. So, um, like, when we'd have to train, uh, guys would be like, oh, you're so, like, why do we got to do this? But not with Jimmy McCroston, our strength coach. He did it all with us. So if we had to do, like, like a thousand crunches, he had to do them with us. 
And if we had to do, go run five miles, he did it with us. And so what he inevitably, what he did by doing that is he took away our ability to complain. Like we can't complain about it because we're like, hey, this is hard. He's like, I know, isn't this terrible, right? And because he's, he's along with us. And in the same way, Jesus Christ, he is a sympathetic and empathetic high priest. It says that Jesus became a man and suffered like you and I. So when we're going through stuff, it's Jesus like, I know. I'm, I've been there, and I'm with you now. And if you don't believe me, uh, you can just uh, read the book of Daniel later on, right? Familiar passage of scripture. Remember the three Hebrew boys won't bow down to the golden image of Nebuchadnezzar. And so uh, what does he do? And Nebuchadnezzar throws him into the fiery furnace. But to, to Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar's been mad on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar's uh, chagrin is he sees, hey, I thought we threw three people in the fire. I see four. And the fourth one looks like the son of the gods. See, Christ, Christ, incar Christ was in the fire with the, the boys. And so God is with us in the fiery trial. Joseph, he loses everything but his faith. And he's hanging on to the reality that God's going to be with me even in Egypt. You remember another guy named Job? It's not Ja. All right, it's Job. And Job, uh, he had a tough little go for a little while, didn't he? But, but what we find through his trial, Job would not let go of the fact that God was with him until finally God restored everything that was taken times two. And, and something interesting happens. You should go back and read the names that he names his daughters. In genealogies, women, sorry girls, were not usually included in the genealogy, but the Bible saw fit to include Job's daughters. And you want to hear uh, what, what one of their names was? I'm going to butcher it, but it's, it's Karen Hapuk. Karen Hapuk. And you know what it means? It means eyeshadow. He called his girl Maybelline. <laughs> Why? Because God is the one to make everything beautiful in his time. And that's what we know, that God is with us in the fire. Um, here we go. God is with you in the fight. God is with you when you're in the fight. Uh, I don't know if, how many of you have the fight of faith. Uh, so, um, so back in my hockey playing days, you can Google this, um, but um, there's, there's, the, there's the top three fighters in all of, the, of all time in the NHL is a guy by the name of Bob Probert, uh, number two would be Joe Koser, and number three would be a guy named Ty Domi. Um, your pastor got beat up by two of the three, um, and, and I, I avoided getting beat up by the number one, Bob Probert. So Bob Probert was playing for the Chicago Blackhawks. I was playing for the Carolina Hurricanes, and we were playing against them. And a little skinny guy for Chicago is a guy named Doug Gilmore. He's in the Hall of Fame now. But uh, he was a little bit of, uh, he, he, would, he would disturb you, all right? Because he was standing in front of my net, and I'm like, hey, man, you ain't standing in front of my net. Boom, I give him a shot with my stick like that. Um, I wasn't as sanctified as I am now. And, and so he turns around, and he whacks me across the skates with his stick, and he gets in my face. And he's just a little guy. And I'm like, oh, I'm going to drop you, and then we're going to drop the gloves. He just looks over, his, his winger, Bob Probert, no teeth, head this big, and, and all of a sudden he gives me a look, and Doug Gilmore looks at me and goes, you know what, if you touch me, he's going to kill you. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, you're probably right, see ya. <laughs> Went back to the bench, I'm like, I want no part of that, and the good news is that's our story. That Jesus says uh, in the Gospels, he says, you know what, you know what I'm like? He says that, that there's a strong man who torments and terrorizes. But when a stronger man comes, he will bind up the strong man and spoil his house. We serve the strong one. The strong man is with us. He's in us. So Moses, God tells Moses, hey, uh, I want you to go and tell the greatest nation on the planet, you tell that King Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses is like, oh, he starts coming with all these excuses while he can't do it. And you can understand why. And God's like, hey, it's okay. I'll be with you. And then he's like, well, listen, I don't speak well. God even sets him up there. Well, guess what? I will be with your mouth. All right? And so God, that is the deal. That's the game changer for us. God is with us. God goes to Joshua. Hey, I want you to take the promised land. You know the promised land that your people have been trying to get in for hundreds of years and no one could do it? You know the promised land with 31 kings that are in there, and then some of which are giants? Yeah, that land? Yeah, I want you to go take it. Josh is like, uh, uh. God says, oh, and by the way, I will be with you always. 
right? And so that is the good news of our strength. He's with you in the fight. God is with you um, when you feel forgotten. Anyone ever feel forgotten, overlooked? Um, in 1 Samuel 16, we, we read the story of the prophet Samuel goes to Jesse and he goes to anoint his children, his son, one of them, which will be king. And he lines up the seven sons of Jesse and God's like, nope, 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 all seven. Samuel's like, are you sure that's everybody? And then Jesse, now get this, oh yeah, I do have another kid. His name is David. He's out with the sheep. Like, his old man forgot that he existed. And so if you've ever felt overlooked, but David comes, he's not overlooked by God because God says, that's my anointed one. Samuel anoints him with oil, and the scripture's clear that he was never, ever the same after that because God was with him. Um, and so if you feel forgotten, God loves forgotten folk. Um, if you, like, our, the, the story of our Bible is God using forgotten people. Like, you know, in our story that we talked about last week, remember Leah? Leah was cross-eyed. Rachel was the hot one. God chose Leah to give birth to Judah, who would uh, eventually give uh, birth to the Messiah, right? He chooses Leah, not Rachel. God chooses a, a little forgotten peasant girl named Mary to give birth to the Savior. Uh, God cheer, uh, chooses an old, washed-up couple, uh, uh, Elizabeth and Zachariah, to give birth to the forerunner. Um, I, I've, I've said it this way, uh, God is, is about this. God will take a bunch of nobodies, and he's going to turn them to people, but to a bunch of nobodies uh, that will tell everybody about somebody who can save anybody. Don't make me say that again, all right? But that's what God does. He takes a, couple, a bunch of nobodies because God loves nobodies, and he, makes them, into, and he uh, makes them into somebodies. And so God is with you in the fire and the fight when you feel forgotten. And in the New Testament, we, we learn this. Jesus says this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And so um, I think the question for us should not be, is God with me? I think that's a, there's a clear answer to that. But I think we're asking the wrong question. So um, uh, I want you to feel what the proper question should be. And so um, here's what I'm going to do. As far as I can tell, we're, that we're getting air-conditioned spirit in here. So all right, here we go. We're gonna, so I'm not going to ask the question. I'm going to get a uh, uh, Grammy Award-winning Lenny Kravitz. Uh, this song was nominated for two Grammys. Uh, it was actually uh, recorded in Hoboken. Uh, and so, uh, so let's help us out a little bit, uh, would you, Izzy? you got to feel it. who that is awesome and so that of course is Lenny Kravitz uh, hit single are you gonna go my way it's it's actually do you know on the back of Lenny Kravitz's back it says Jesus Christ has my heart it's a messianic song uh, the lyrics begin like this uh, I was born long ago I am the chosen I'm the one I have come to save the day and I won't leave until I've done and then the refrain will go like this, are you going to go my way? He says it cooler, though, are you going to go my way, right, like that? But, um, but that's how it goes. And, and honestly, I think that's the question for us today. The question is not, um, is God with you? But my question to you is this, are you with God? Because uh, like, like the scriptures tell us that, that we find refuge and shelter under the shadow of his wings. That, that when we're near to God, that we're protected, we're in his presence, God is with us but we can tend to wander. Uh, Jesus' appeal to us is this, come and follow me. And so are you with Jesus Christ? God is with you. Are you with him this morning? Number two is this, that God is good. God is good. That's the second thing we grab onto. Uh, let me read to you Genesis 50, verses 18 to 20. Genesis 50, verses 18 to 20. Uh, it says this, uh, his brothers also came and fell down before him, that him being Joseph, and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. And so here's what we see, that, that God is good. And listen, I've there's, there's moments in your life where you're like, I don't see how this could be good. 
Um, uh, here's, here's what, it's, I think you'll agree with me on this, that it's not till we know the end of the story that we know whether it's, it's a tragedy or a triumph. You just don't know. Like if you, if you just kind of bop into a story in the middle of it and pe peer into a portion of it, you could think it's a tragedy when in fact it's a triumph. The tragedy set you up for the triumph. And so um, uh, this is, um, uh, let me give you a few people. Like if you were to peer into this gentleman's life, Michael Jeffrey Jordan, um, uh, who uh, you, may, you may know is Air Jordan. Uh, Michael Jordan, a lot of you guys looked at me like, who is this Jordan you speak of? I'm like, please, you know who Michael Jordan is, right? But a bunch of LeBron people, please, right? And um, Michael Jeffrey Jordan, peer into him as a high school student being called in the high school coach's office, and the coach tells him, sorry, you don't have what it takes. Maybe keep working on your jump shot, right? And so he gets cut from his high school team. I mean, that sounds tragic to a high school kid, but I got news for you. Keep reading the story. Um, there's, a, there's another one, uh, Thomas Edison. We've heard of him, right? Uh, do, do you know this? Uh, he sent home and from elementary school with a note from his teacher. Mom opens up the note, and the note says this. Your son, he's too stupid to learn anything. Can we agree teaching was different back then, right? <laughs> Uh, so your son is too stupid to learn anything. Please do not send him back to school. Um, like, that's tragic. Um, for the record, his mom didn't let him see that, and she tells him uh, that, oh, no, I, the letter says this. You're too uh, exceptional for the other children, too smart, that uh, they, want, they want you to learn at home. <laughs> so he, uh, can we agree that that little boy, uh, it wasn't a tragedy? It's this epic triumph. Let me give you another one. Albert Einstein, right? This great physicist, this brilliant, brilliant mind. Well, our brilliant mind, little Albert, you know, he didn't start, um, he, di he didn't start uh, speaking until he was four. So, in other words, not a word. And we're like, come on, Albert, use your words, son. Use your words. Nothing till four years old. Uh, and then he didn't learn to read till he was seven. It was so much so that they thought he was mentally challenged, like something's wrong with this young man. Uh, I think his story turns out okay, right? You got to keep reading. And then this one's my favorite one, uh, J.K. Rowling. You know her? Harry Potter, okay? So uh, you, if you peered into her life, J.K. Rowling, uh, divorced, single mom, battling depression, trying to go through school while at the same time writing a novel. Is she going to make it? I don't know. Fast forward, keep reading the story. She's worth $1 billion right now, okay? And here's, I, I say all that to say this, your story's not done. Like, I, I look at some of you, and you're, I'm like, God's not done. Like, your story is not a tragedy. Remember, we know the end of the story. We know it. Your story is a triumph of Almighty God. We're a triumphant people. God assures us in Romans 8, 28, he's going to cause everything work for good those who love him. Um, and so uh, God changes Joseph's tragedy and turns it into a triumph. So here's what I need us to see. What does God do through all that mess of slavery and imprisonment? Let me show you what God's doing. He's training Joseph. Like, do, do you know what God's doing? Like, I just love this. I, I, I can't believe I say this. Poor Satan. <laughs> right? Poor guy. Like, Satan's like, watch this. He gets his evil, evil demons with him, and he's like, Watch me jack with this little Joseph kid. I'm going to sell him into slavery. <laughs> Watch out. Sells him into slavery. And what's happening the entire time is God's instilling in him wisdom, organizational skills, leadership, authority. He's exercising spiritual gifts to discern dreams. And he's positioning why? To make him the second in command in, uh, of the entire planet at that time. Not only is God doing that, jo God is going to position Joseph to save not just Egypt, the known world. The world was starving due to this famine, but God used Joseph uh, to, to help feed the entire planet. You know what else God is doing? God is making Egypt the wealthiest nation on the planet at this time. They become the, the wealthiest in all the world. And you know why? Because he, he's about to say, uh, all that wealth is going to be plundered by a group of people you might know as Israel, as Moses leads them out of Egypt, but that's next week's story, okay? Uh, and, then, and then what else happens? God positions 
the 12 sons of Jacob, and they wind up living back in Egypt. See God as at work. Um, Kim, why don't you come on? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start to close, but, but before I do, I, I need to, to emphasize something here right now. And so I am a, I'm the anti-illustration guy, but I have an illustration for you today as far as like props a prop for you because I love you. Um, <laughs> uh, remember, I, we're talking about perspective this morning. And if we hang on to the fact that what, that what God is with you and God is good, God is with you and God is good. And this is the perspective we need to grab a hold of to get us through the crazy seasons um, in our life. But I, I want to give you uh, another perspective, and that is this. And I'm going to read 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. The, the Apostle Paul says this. He says, have nothing to do with irreverent, irreverent silly myths. But here's what he says. He says, rather, train yourself for godliness. For while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds the promise for the present life, and get this, and also for the life to come. So uh, I'm going to get your pop. I'm totally ripping off this illustration. Has anyone heard of a guy named Francis Chan? Some of us? Great. If you haven't, then this is my illustration. All right. <laughs> Um, and so I got, uh, I got for us this rope. Let me see if I can do this. And so now, if you can just believe, kind of visualize with me, this rope is life. This is, this is an eternity. And I got a knot up road. And if you could just figure that rope going behind, it's an, it never ends. It's, it's eternity. And now what I want to show you is this. This section is time. Um, and so somewhere on here is, is you and me. And uh, here's what I want us to see is how much energy, how much um, effort and focus do we put on this? Isn't it everything? Like, like when you look at that and this is all you have to work with, like think about the madness of, oh, we're, we're going to save up a bunch of money and then, and then we're going we're gonna, to uh, sacrifice all this so we can go away here, right? Uh, or we're going we're gonna to not do this and not do that. And, and, and here's the funny thing is there's all this eternity that still awaits us. And so um, I'm not sure if you've ever tried to live the Christian life and so you you, you act a certain way with your money and you 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 were able to sacrifice time and, and people would look at you and they're going you're crazy look at you're missing out here you're missing out here and here's what my appeal would be to them no you're crazy you're building for here and I'm I'm storing up for all this stuff never ending never ending and so the good news for the believer this morning is this God says that godliness, we win now and also for the life to come. And that's the perspective we need.